patient with us. Um, so thank you everyone for being here today. We are going to talk about what it's like to have an international career with Roberto Gomez de la Fuente. And uh, Roberto is an actuary with 10 years of experience in insurance and reinsurance. He has held various roles in Mexico, Colombia, and the United States for both life and non-life uh, business. He is an optimist with great capacity for constant learning and is passionate about actuarial topics. Um, Roberto currently works as a treaty property product underwriter for Swiss Re at Mexico, at the Mexico office, and he has a bachelor's degree in actuarial science from Instituto Tecno Tecnológico Autónomo de México. And he has been an associate of the Society of Actuaries since 2021. Roberto um, speaks English and Spanish. If any of you have a question you would like to ask in Spanish, we are definitely happy to take those questions and we will translate for the rest of, I will translate for the rest of the, of the audience. Um, a, there is a button at the bottom that you can see that says Q&A. That's where you can enter your questions for Roberto. You can enter them at any time. You don't need to wait till the end um, because we want to make sure that you ask the questions um, and you get the information that you need to get from, from this uh, webinar. So without further ado, Roberto, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you found the actual profession, what attracted you to it and what got you started? Okay, thank you. So uh, the first time I heard about the word uh, actuary, actuario, Mexico actuaria, whatever, uh, it was in 2007. I was at my last year in high school, and I was trying to find out what to do with my life at that moment. You know, that's a big decision. What career do you want to pursue? Uh, where do you want to study? Um, you know, and somehow my my teachers and and uh, professional guidance in, in in high school told me that there was something that I, that they think I would be really good at, which was uh, an actuary. Uh, before that, I had like a passion about physics, but you know, research in Mexico is not so developed, so I was afraid about uh, finishing giving, you know, uh, classes at university or high school and not being like uh, financially successful on that part. You know, it's trying to find. Uh, where I was good at, uh, what was my passion, and how can I help the society. It, it has a concept in Japanese culture, which is Ikigai. So I was trying to find out about that one. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have any um, like actuaries in my life. I came from a small city here in Mexico at the southeastern part of, of the state. Um, so I had no idea how an actuary will look like or what they do at that moment. Somehow I managed to go into the college and uh, pursuing my degree it happened that I was at the heart of the, you know, of the university when I found out what an actuary actually was. So it took me, you know, two years to find out what these guys do for a living and how it managed risk. There were three words that, that I think that were, were fantastic at the beginning and kind of catchy. The first ones were uh, mathematics and the other one were risk management, right? So when I was 20 or something like that, I found out what uh, those words really mean, mean to me. Um, my first experience professionally came at 21 years old. I started working for an insurance company here in Mexico and then I found out what an actuary actually did, right? Um, I heard about the SOA very at the beginning because it was like, you know, at that moment at the top. And if you Google it, it, it comes, you know, like, okay, so it's a factory, sounds kind of interesting. And for sure, I want to be part of this. So that was, you know, back in 2007. And after that, it just came like um, really hard to, to find out how to sit for exams in Mexico. But somehow I, um, with my colleagues in, in, in university started to do that. Um, I started really late in, in my life doing exams. I was 20 years old when I started doing exams. Uh, just after um, earning my degree in actuarial sciences in Mexico. So, you know, you can start before that. You can um, start in, in the university. Um, 
but I tried after so my first um, professional experience when I decided to, to become an actuary from the SOA. And that's how it started. Very interesting. And by the way, 20 is not old to start your exams. We have um, candidates that are changing careers at different points in their lives, in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s. So you started at the time that worked for you. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that you had uh, somebody kind of like mentoring you or helping you with this um, process of becoming an actuary. Can you tell us a little bit about what, how, how was your experience with that? Is did you find other mentors throughout your career or your your uh, exam uh, pathway, and how did that influence or help you? Well, it, at the beginning, it was really hard. I was working in a company that, you know, is uh, Mexican, so they don't uh, tend to do these kind of uh, things uh, outside of the Mexican society of actuaries. So at the beginning, it was hard. All the exams and the material studies uh, were being paid out of my pocket totally. So, you know, it, it was hard to try to keep going in, into the exams because I had to uh, do little savings to pay for that. Um, and after a while, I, I'm just like learning where companies uh, we had in Mexico, I found out that there were companies um, with U.S.-based offices. You know, there's a lot of international companies here in Mexico that come from other places. And somehow I managed to get into that new company. Um, and I found out that they were launching a program for the Latin America and actuarial development. You know, it's like super cool because they had like very specific rules for the US and, and abroad. But there were a lot of things that were not doing for, for Latin American actuaries who were pursuing to have these things. And one of the things that uh, the chief actuary at that moment, Andy Rallis, who also was a president from the Society yeah. of Actuaries some few years ago, uh, wanted to do is that all the actuaries from from this company should have like, you know, the the resources available to go through the actuarial careers. So that's where I started. I mean, that, that I keep going with with the exams. Um, there were a lot of supportive people about. Um, planning where you want, when, when you want to do the, the exams and, and the things you were needing for, for you know, as it gets complex, how, how they could uh, help you to get through this. Um, and some actuaries that were also a little bit advanced than me, they were giving me like some uh, advices. But uh, at that point, I will say that I didn't have like a mentor only for exams, but I had mentors for my professional development which was also provided as a formal, you know, like a mentoring program in this company. And, you know, it's good to have both of them. Uh, but actually, I think it was uh, better to have uh, a mentor, not only for exams, but for all uh, professional development. So that's a, a good advice I, I give to you. Um, try to find someone who uh, helps you to be a mentor. It's like a formal relationship because you have both to put part of, of, of you know, time of, of both parts and uh, make it a, a commitment to, to work in the things you want to work, be clear on what you want to work in that part. Uh, a mentor is not forever, that, that's the thing. It, it can manage you to, to go to some part of your life in your professional life or your study exams, but it will not last forever, at least at that uh, rigorous part. Um, Fortunately, I have uh, advanced in those relationships and now are good friends to me. And anytime I need an, ad an advice, they gladly uh, give it to me. So that's cool. So mentorships are good. Try to find one for exams and try to find one for life. Very, very important. Um, in the chat, I just put um, a little note. We do have almost 400 mentors available around the world for affiliate members. It's part of your affiliate membership. So you can just find one in your area or in your area of practice. Um, and you can learn more about mentor link in your affiliate page. We have a question from sure. Pedro Couto. What made you want to go international with your career? 
Well, that's a, a good one. And I think the first uh, answer or word that comes to me is curiosity. You know, I wanted to know how to be, um, not how to be, but uh, what's the actual practice around the world. And that comes to be very different in Latin America than the US or Asia or wherever you want to, to do that. You know, so curiosity drive drove me at that moment and it keeps driving me in my professional career just to see how different practices can be around the world. The other one is that I come from, uh, from Mexico, you know, and we have some ways to do the things, but actually we always adopt uh, like the top notch uh, practices. And those come from Europe and, and US and Canada. So that's, you know, the part of, of like being at the top notch of the, of the practice and trying to find that way. And once you decide to do that, uh, it comes very interesting opportunities in your professional life because now you are able to uh, solve problems in a more general and complex environment, not only for one specific country or, or particular thing, but you know, you, you learn now how to solve problems in a wider um, and complex environment. So that's how it comes, just by curiosity. And the other things just start coming by. So we mentioned at the beginning that you worked in the United States, you worked in Colombia, you worked in Mexico. How has that in international experience in different markets and in different countries influenced your work as an actuary? I think the first thing here is to recognize there's a lot of differences and not, a lot, not all of them will think about the same way you do. So it came to have uh, to be open-minded about uh, different ways to do things, and not all, not all of them are wrong, you know. So I was I was very narrow at some point with uh, what is actually right, and after that it just comes to have different approaches to different complex of, of problems, mm -hmm. and those problems come tied with um, some context, and the context can be like regulatory changes or constraints, let's say in that way, uh, the actual development practice in, in each country, uh, very specific uh, once in a lifetime implementations like solvency two or, you know, any regulations that might be changing from once in a while or IFRS 17 now, which is something that really changes the vision of the things. Um, also, the, you know, like the cultural baggage of the people that you are working with um, influence the way now you think. So that narrow vision that I had at the very beginning started to get wider and wider and wider. And I learned to uh, listen better instead of speaking better. You know, that's, that's the <laughs> other. Uh, just to be a good uh, problem solver, you have to have big eyes and ears and small mouth. So that's, you know, that, that's also like, uh, it happened to me. I, I just, uh, my eyes and, and ears started to get bigger and my mouth started to get uh, smaller. So that's, that's funny too. But yeah, it, I mean, uh, having different um, cultural opinions and, and baggages there, it helps you to have uh, a lot of flexibility on how you solve problems. And that, um, that is also great advice for life to listen more yeah. and and speak less sometimes. Um, yes. Ryan has a bunch of questions, so we're going to go into sure. it. Um, how does one go, uh, I'm sorry, how does one go from the United States somewhere in South America? Then he says, could I work in South America if my Spanish is only all right? And what is the best way to find an actuarial role, role in South America? So maybe there's a way for you to address this three questions yeah. from Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Just let's try to, to put it in in the best order. So uh, there's a thing that in most countries in in Latin America um, just doesn't uh, speak English well, but you can figure it out because it is easier to um, all people try to speak in a well-known uh, language, which is English, instead of trying to know the language. And I think your Spanish will get better once you get in 
you know, you put your feet in, in Latin America, that's for sure. I know some people that came from the U.S. and, and basically once they, they were into Colombia or Mexico or Argentina, they just went so fluent with the language and, and they were just doing good, you know. That's, that's the thing, just put yourself in that, um, you know, non-comfortable situation and, and, and you will get it. Um, the other one is uh, to become an actuary in uh, practice in actuary in, in in Mexico or Colombia or Argentina, which are the countries I know uh, a little bit better, and also Chile, is um, that if you have the the or, or you are an ASA or FSA, you will be like you know um, in practice well recognized about your abilities to. Um, um, actuarial skills. That's that's for sure. But there are another constraints about uh, being able to um, have a formal degree there. Because if you have, if you want to have a permit there, you m might have to do some revalidations on your studies and what you did for. And sometimes that's not quite straightforward. But if you are working for an international company, they will figure out a way to help you to go through this. As a fun fact, when I, I did a rotation in the U.S. for three months, I had uh, I was not a credentialed actuary for for U.S. and Canada. I was not an ASA or FSA at that moment, so my work permit became as a mathematician, right? And, and it was funny, and uh, and I have that that uh, paper nowadays because I, I am a, a mathematician now too, and when I went. Um, to live to Colombia, my um, bachelor's degree became as an economist in, in Colombia, because there there were no um, equal qualifications into like uh, studying degrees from one country to another. And in Mexico, we have a lot of um, uh, universities that offer this as a bachelor's degree. So, but in Colombia, that doesn't exist. So when 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 educational um, uh, Magistery or, or, or uh, secretary did, did that translation. It came that okay, you are an economist here. You, you're, that's an actor. I don't know what's that. They have uh, postgraduate studies there, but that, that's not a bachelor's degree here. So you will become an economist. So I am an economist in <laughs> in Colombia, but in practice I am an actor, and I, I I am glad of that and and all the the, the doors that 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 has opened to me. Uh, definitely, if you work for an international company, they will manage to put you there. Um, you will have the willingness to, to be there too, to get out of the comfort zone and maybe to learn dancing because all Latinos dance, you know, first that comes with the, with the rotations in Latin America. Very fun. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of other questions. Um, if, sure. I hope, um, since we had a little bit of that technical difficulties at the beginning, if you, if you would be available for just to go a little over the time that we had. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, we have Give More asks, from the experience you've had in this path, is it possible to secure an internship in this field without having exams as a first year student in college? That's a good question. Uh, in my personal experience, which is different uh, from what you usually expect in that and what I have heard from U.S. colleagues is that it will definitely uh, differentiate your, per, your profile and uh, people is making like, you know, the selection process. Uh, but I think that's not the only thing. So if you can start with a internship or summer internship or something like that, then you might be able to clinch something into more formal way. And I think most or what I have heard is most companies in U.S. support exams. <laughs> So they are not required to um, have prior exams. It will differentiate you, definitely, but it will not be the only thing that they will uh, look for you into the in internships. And there's some very important uh, topic I want to uh, emphasize here. Technical skills are relevant, but also soft skills. So never let that part uh, become irrelevant for your uh, development at any point. Uh, so it's, I, th I think it's just a mix. It will differentiate, but it might not if you have good uh, other skills, like, you know, programming or something like that. And we are going, we have some questions about that, but let's first answer Anonymous. 
question. Uh, he or she asks, what advice would you give to women entering the actuary profession? I think barriers now have become uh, easier to trespass. I, I know there's a lot of things into um, bringing equality into the, into the profession. I might think that I know more uh, women actuaries than men actuaries. And both of them are, you know, just like uh, super empowered. Because uh, I think actuaries, what do value the most is experience instead of other things, and I might say that um, best leaders I I had I, and, and I ever had in in my you know like uh, direct interaction had become from women. So you might be empowered, you might find some um, other ways to think about this, but nowadays and since I started in the profession, I think that is no a, a barrier. So just try to be yourself, be confident about your skills. Uh, don't pretend to be someone else or try to uh, get this masculine way to, to lead because now we need diversity and uh, women bring this to the table and hopefully you will find a way to get into a management position and you will find a way uh, being yourself, not being someone else. You know, that, that's very old school now. We are trying to uh, bring diversity in, into the management decisions because that, that brings a wider... Uh, way to think and that comes because my sister is just a uh, stem woman and she's mm -hmm. doing really well in, in her career she is an engineering biotechnological engineering as you know so i feel that I, like i'm talking to my sister and saying there is nothing you uh, put yourself in your mind that you can achieve so just okay. keep trying and, and find good mentors and and try to um, find your same style to to become a leader I also put a, um, a link in the chat for NAWA, which is the Network of Actual Women and Allies. It's a great resource if you want to check it out. And they have uh, mentors and all kinds of resources for women um, yeah. who are interested in the actual profession. Yeah. Uh, the next question comes from Angelo Peregrino. Hola, Roberto. Saludos de Angelo. And gracias por esta presentación and for your time. We are going back and forth, English and Spanish. <laughs> he yes, has two sure. questions. What statistical programming software do you usually use as an actuary? Okay, that first one comes at um, not really programming software. You know, it's good to know like some languages to do uh, database crunching and, and be able to do good analysis there. Um, once you get uh, comfortable with one, you can go and up and forth with with some other else's because it will depend on the company that you know the the licenses they will have to uh, work with, SAS for example, or there was something super old which is uh, Fox Pro that was quite used in Latin America yet. Um, access it will depend actually how you can adapt to a new language, but you might have like. Um, the basics to do programming. If you're trying to do like uh, fitting curves or something like that, I think that like the most popular now is Python or maybe R Studio because they are free to use, but it will depend also in the company if they want you to allow that. But again, the thing is how you can uh, manage to learn these new things and you are um, familiar with, with the techniques you are actually using for. So uh, programming, it doesn't, uh, matters too much and my favorite tool uh, so far since the beginning and nowadays is Excel that will always work <laughs> you know it's like uh, the word you can always do something simple and then if you have a 90 team they will um, transform everything to you and make it happen with a lot of um, science there so it, it will depend uh, actually that you feel comfortable with uh, one common language and the structures and know what you want to do. And after all that, that will come. I mean, programming is just like a huge uh, skill, no matter the, the software. I also wanted to tell Roberto and everybody else that um, there, as part of your affiliate benefits, there is an R Studio uh, sandbox where you can learn R Studio or practice it for free with there's some data um, sets that you can play with. 
And there's also two Excel, Excel Basics and Excel Advanced courses that are part of your affiliate membership benefits. So check that out, those out on your affinity, um, on your affiliate page, because those are all available and free to you. The second question from Angelo is what alg algorithm, i.e. time series, multiple variable, multiple regression, SVM, bootstrapping, log regression, et cetera, et cetera, is more common in your field? And gracias. Well, that will depend a lot of uh, what you're trying to fit, for example. Um, I know that uh, general, generalized linear models are used for auto insurance and uh, developing rates. I know bootstrapping is for uh, reserving in some uh, lack of data triangles when you are doing IVNR. Uh, you know, it will depend a lot of a very specific task. It is good to have, uh, to be familiar with those ones. I, I have been using some of them um, in my profession, maybe at the very be beginning, but after that, um, you know, you will never have to forget about uh, making um, reasonable uh, analysis of the information that you got and the outputs you have. So. You know, there's a lot of things happening there. There's a lot of uh, models nowadays being used for analyzing different uh, effects on policy behaviors and insurance. And nowadays that I'm in property, you know, a lot of uh, simulation processes. Um, I, I don't have just an answer. There, there's just a lot of things happening there. And, you know, once you are started, or getting started into, into a new position, you will have to read some things if you really want to understand about the models and you know follow the SOPs about uh, modeling and all those things that uh, are being uh, running around. And that's a cool thing. You will always find some things or new implementations or techniques that were not able to be used in the past, like uh, because of lack of information, because now we have better information because now we can assume better things, you know, there's a lot of things um, that new technologies brings to, into the table and makes our work easier and use more complex techniques in, 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 in a fashion, in a fashion sense, you know. Very cool. Roberto, yeah. do you have time? We have four more questions. Do you have time or do you want us to, do you have to? I, I can solve one question more. Uh, okay. I'm so sorry about this. It so was I am going to let you, you can see the questions. I am going to let yeah. you pick the question. Um, there's actually five. And and then we unfortunately have to go. Okay. I have an anonymous one, which is in Spanish. So it talks about, um, I will speak it in English. Uh, it says about working in a um, Hispanic uh, speaker country but he doesn't know how to adjust into the uh, legal and, you know, like um, feel and how to, to, to get into the countries and because he becomes from the US and he only knows that um, that insurance industry. I'll tell you something, and that's one of the hard things, but also like the most beautiful that happens here is that you learn a lot when you defy what you know. and. That's the thing, you you will be, or you are able if you go through the SOA to uh, solve problems. And uh, to solve problems, you have to collect data, to find the problem, and then try to uh, propose a solution. Um, whatever it comes from a different country that, than yours, it's just the context of the problem. And one of the things I love the most about um, pursuing my SOA career is that it definitely, definitely prepares you to become an uh, excellent problem solver. No matter you don't know the context, no matter you don't know a lot of things about there, but you will learn it and you will put it into the, you know, like your model box or whatever you are trying to solve and you will find a way. So the best thing here is get prepared to, to become that. So it's a, it's a good example of that. And all the regulatory things and, and the context of a business of one country it's just part of the problem, you know? It's just like uh, the constraints you have to uh, put the solution there. So just look for the opportunities and, and take the risk. And that's not only for you, uh, it's for people who's listening to me. 
right? That is great. If you, if you go through this, you will become a really good uh, problem solver. That's for sure. That is true. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Roberto, for joining us today and answer all these questions. As you can see, uh, you, they, our guests had a lot of curiosity about an international career, and we really appreciate your uh, point of view in this. And hopefully we can talk to you soon again and answer the rest of sure. the questions. Sure, and also you can contact me in LinkedIn or whatever you want to have uh, some personal advice or whatever you need. Uh, just feel free to reach out and I will definitely uh, answer your questions back. Thank you very much, Martha. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your Friday and a good weekend. And thank you everyone for joining us. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.